I'm Carl Baldessar with another great classic rock riff review and today we're going to be talking about the great Joe Walsh and we're going to be looking at three amazing riffs from his early period with the James Gang. So I'm talking about 1969 to 1971 in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I'm at, and it was way before his solo career and even further before his Eagles career. And you have to remember, Joe Walsh was actually pretty early on in the history of great rock guitars. He came in just after the British Invasion guitar players and just before all the 70s rock guitarists. So he's really there in the foundation of rock guitar. So for my first riff I'm going to look at, it's going to be Funk 49, the great riff from the second studio album by the James Gang, which was called The James Gang Rides Again. That album was released in July of 1970. It made it to the 59th slot on the Billboard chart that year, and it was recorded in November 1969, and Joe Walsh was 21, just turning 22 years old on November 20th that year, and he came up with this most amazing guitar riff at such a young age. Man, this riff has so much attitude and so much groove going for it, and right off the bat, man, you got this really smoking pluck mute guitar sound. <laughs> I mean, that thing is dripping with attitude, and it really takes off from there because then he starts getting into the great riff of the song, which goes... I mean, this riff has so much groove in it, and my definition of what a good groove is, is you never want it to end. And when you play this riff, man, you never want it to end. And fans, when they listen to it, they never want it to end. He just hit gold with this riff. And what's really cool about this song is that you get a second set of riffs, which are excellent. These little pentatonic riffs that he does in a turnaround. They go like this. <laughs> So he's got that A pentatonic, and then he takes it up a whole step to a B pentatonic. Right? And then he turns that whole thing around with the classic E7 sharp 9 stinger. You know, kind of that Hendrix chord, or so they call it the Hendrix chord. But, you know, it was made famous by Hendrix on Purple Haze, but it existed before that. But you forget just how, you know, talking about Hendrix, how in the mix that Joe Walsh was at the time he wrote this riff. I mean, Hendrix was still alive, Janis Joplin was still alive, uh, Jim Morrison was still alive, the Beatles were still a band, technically, at the very end. They just released Abbey Road. I mean, he was right there on the ground floor, and I can't stress that enough. I mean, you could even argue that Joe Walsh might be worthy of being on the Mount Rushmore of rock guitar players. He's that important. So the other cool thing about this song is just the structure of it. It's actually really tight in the telling and it's super efficiently written. Now it's in the key of D, you wouldn't think so because we're really just playing an A7th to start with a... So we have the five chord is really kind of the focal part of the song, the A7. But we actually hit a D chord, the one chord. So we're really kind of playing five to one. So it's, it's basically five, one, five, one, five. So you're just going back and forth through the, the five and the one chord, and so it's got a really nice sort of tight little shape there, kind of structure-wise. And then when you get to the turnaround parts, these pentatonic riffs, if you zoom out and look at the architecture of that, not, not that he did that or thought about this, but the reason why I think this thing holds together so well is that this turnaround section where he's doing the A pentatonic and the B pentatonic, actually he's kind of moving us to the key of E major for one second, because if you look at the A minor, you kind of have a, an A sound, right? And in the key E, A is the four chord. And then when he moves up to B, you know, you get the B sound. In the key of E, that's really kind of the five chord. You know, wanting to resolve to E, okay? So we momentarily shift, I think, harmonically, tonally, to the key of E. But what's really cool, what he does here, instead of playing an E for the one chord there, he actually plays a dominant seventh chord. And then he puts some eyebrows on it with the sharp nine stinger. Right? With that Hendrix sounding chord. So he's going from four of A, five B, and then the one chord E, but he's actually substituting a dominant seventh chord, sharp nine. So 
a five chord, a dominant seventh, points back to one. So what's the one chord if E7 is the five chord? The one chord would be A. And he's actually not playing an A there, he's playing another dominant seventh chord. A7, so you have a dominant seventh chord, E, going to another dominant seventh chord, A, and voila, you've got a five of five progression, or what we call a secondary dominant. He put that in there. Now, I don't think he knew what that was. Maybe he did, I don't know. But when you have that kind of progression, man, it really turns around so great. <laughs> points us right back to the top of the riff. So this thing is so well constructed. And I gotta maybe add that Joe Walsh's mother was a classical pianist and a musicologist. So maybe he did know something a little bit about that. I know he said he didn't read music that much, but he, he was really raised with a good set of ears. Now for my second Joe Walsh riff, we're gonna go to the third album by the James Gang, which is called, ready for this? thirds <laughs> and that album was released in April of 1971 and the song Walk Away wound up being the highest charting song for the James Gang. It went to number 51 on the Billboard charts of that year and this thing just has a really great riff to it to open up and it goes like this. <laughs> That's just, again, another great groovy kind of funky riff from Joe Walsh. So what makes this riff so cool is how he syncopates the rhythm on it, okay? So watch what he's doing. He's going one, two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one, and two, and three, and four, and one. And you know, normally on a syncopated riff like that, I would actually do the syncopation with the upstrokes, but he's actually doing it with a downstroke, and it actually gives a little bit more of an edge. So watch this, he's going. You know, so that downstroke on the upbeats, which isn't natural, actually gives it a nice little punch, I think. Oh, and the other thing I want to point out on that riff, what he's doing, and this is something that all the great rock guitar players do there when they're doing their bar chords, especially in this position where they're hitting, in this case, an A chord. And when they go to the four chord, it's just a really subtle little bar that you can hardly even see. Take a look at my hand, when he, how he hits the D chord. You see that? I mean, it's barely moving, but I'm, I'm barring the D chord with three notes just in my hand like that. So I'm just a little bit of a roll right there. So isn't that cool? And a lot of the great guitar players do that. Page does that all the time and they, they all do it. It's just a really comfortable way to kind of grip the guitar and get two chords out of it. And the other thing I'll point out from a structure perspective, we just basically have a one chord going to a four chord going to a one chord. It's going A, D, A. So you've got one, four, back to one. So that's the structure on the main verse. And then when he goes to the chorus, since we're in the key of A, he goes to the chorus and he's hitting F sharp minor, okay? And that really suggests that he's using the sixth chord there. <clears throat> and it, it, it has this kind of giddy up rhythm that he's doing. So it's... Right? And that's really, really cool how he changes the rhythmic texture. You know, he's using a, uh, an eighth note with two sixteenth notes, so you get that chunk, chicka chunk, chicka chunk, chicka chunk, chicka chunk, you know? And that really changes from the verse texture, so I really love that. It makes, makes that chorus kind of stick out, right? And on the chorus, you know, you've got, you've got the sixth chord, and then he's going to the four chord D, and then he goes to the five chord E. So we've got a four, five, and he takes it back to one. So it's a perfectly well-rounded progression in, in, um, in that chorus. Okay, so from the chorus, now let's go to this bridge part, which is where all the juice in this song is, in my estimation. It's so cool what he does. He has this chromatic movement out of the key, and these two chords are just, when I first heard them when I was a kid, I, it just blew me away. So when you're coming from the, um, the chorus, he then ends up on the A chord. <laughs> And then he hits this. So 
So those two chords are so outrageously good and contrast everything else he's doing. And what's going on there is that he's playing a B major chord to a C major chord. Okay? And if we're in the key of A, actually if you're going to play a B and a C chord in the key of A, you would actually play a B minor, not a B major, and you would be playing a C sharp minor, not a C major. But he doesn't do that. He actually plays a B major. Then he goes up a half step, not a whole step to C sharp minor. He goes up to just C major, like that. And what gives that part so much girth is that he's got it played as an inversion. So on the B chord, he's got the F sharp in the bass, okay? So he's got the second inversion of the chord. And that is so thick. And what makes that so thick is that you've got these perfect fourth, perfect fifth, Right, and so you got these fourth and fifths that are stacked. He also has a major third on top. And when you have fourth and fifth, fourth and fifth chords stacked, we call that you know quartals and quintal chords. And those are very Bartok sounding, or very Aaron Copland sounding things. And again, you know, with his mother being a classical musician, I wouldn't be surprised if he heard those kind of sounds as a kid. But the stunning thing is, is how chromatic it is. He's he's moving out of the key of A, and we have the B major and a half step up to the C major with these inversions. It is just a very memorable moment in the song and an amazing trick that he does. So let me play the chorus section into that bridge section so you can hear it all together. Ready? Here it goes. So doesn't that turn around beautifully? I mean, it's such a great shape what happens there. So Walk Away, a great song by the James Gang and Joe Walsh. Now for my third and final Joe Walsh riff from the early period, we're gonna go back to the second studio album from July 1970 and take a look at a song called The Bomber. And it's subtitled Closet Queen, Bolero, and Cast Your Fate to the Wind. Now, it's a really cool, straightforward riff, and let me demonstrate it for you here. So a really cool, straightforward rock riff, but what's really interesting about this song, and I really want to talk about, is this four minute interlude. It's this psychedelic interlude, and that was kind of the thing that you the James Gang really kind of made their mark with is that they would have these big long improvisational sections in their song and this is really what kind of put them on the map back in the day right so this little psychedelic section in the middle has two musical quotes one from classical music and one from jazz and it's those two things I want to talk about so one of the musical quotes in the interlude of this song is by a jazz pianist called Vince Guaraldi and the song is cast your fate to the wind and Vince Guaraldi is the pianist who composed the music for the Charlie Brown Christmas and you all are familiar with that music but he also composed a piece called cast your fate to the wind and Joe Walsh quotes that piece a little bit in the interlude that song was written in 1962 and it won a Grammy in 1963 for best jazz composition so I strongly recommend you go and listen to that but the other quote in the interlude is the one I really want to talk about and that's for Joe Walsh quotes Maurice Ravel's Bolero and I'm sure that this would be a, a classical theme that he must have heard from his mother because she was a classical pianist and he quotes it in the middle of this song. Now before I show you the bolero theme, let me tell you a little bit about what a bolero is. A bolero is a Spanish dance rhythm and it usually includes a lot of triplet type figures. So in the case of Maurice Ravel, he had this really long beautiful string of triplet figures and it was something like this. <laughs> That's one time through, okay? And so it's a series of these triplety type of rhythms, and it's all in 3-4, and there's a beautiful theme that goes over it. So here we go with the Ravel Bolero. <laughs> 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 
So that's one rotation through the Ravel Bolero figure and the Ravel theme on top of it. And I'm sure if you know this song, The Bomber, and listen to the part in the middle where he's doing it with the slide guitar, that's going to sound very familiar to you. An interesting fun fact though, when they released the album with the Maurice Ravel Bolero quote on it, they got about 10,000 copies in the market and then the Ravel family estate threatened a lawsuit against the James Gang for stealing the theme from the Bolero. So they stopped issuing that, they recut it, and then many, many years later everything was settled and then now you can hear the Bolero quote on the recording of the Bomber. But you know, copyrights are copyrights, so they had to actually pull that from the market for some time. So now for the punchline of why I'm talking about this Bolero that Joe Walsh quotes. It's because actually there's a connection between Jeff Beck Jimmy Page, Joe Walsh, Led Zeppelin, and the Yardbirds, and it's all tied to boleros. The fact is, in 1966, 56 years ago, Jeff Beck recorded a song called Beck's Bolero, and he had his own triplety kind of rhythm to it. And at that recording session, on guitar with Jeff Beck was Jimmy Page, playing bass with John Paul Jones of Led Zeppelin, playing drums was Keith Moon. And it's really interesting to me that Joe Walsh, who by the way, gave Jimmy Page his number one, his first and number one Les Paul, because Page never had a Les Paul until Joe Walsh gave him one in 1969. And the point is I find it rather ironic and funny that these guitar players love this bolero figure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna pay, play you the Beck's bolero figure and you'll see how it's sort of related to the Ravel Bolero, and you'll also understand you know, what, you know, where Joe Walsh is coming from in terms of wanting to kind of quote the Boleros. So the triplet figure on the Beck Bolero is a little different than the Ravel Bolero, but you'll recognize the similarities. I'm gonna play you the chord structure behind the famous Beck Bolero. It goes like this. And over that figure, Jimmy Page or Jeff Beck, it's unclear who did it, come, comes up with this soaring lead guitar line that is so amazing, uh, uses this really curious major seventh note of, as part of the melody, and it really, really was an incredible moment in the mid-1960s guitar world. So let me play along with the looper pedal and show you what that sounds like. Last thing I want to say about you know these British guitar players and Joe Walsh and their love for these boleros, Led Zeppelin actually had two boleros in their music. The first one appeared on their first album on the song How Many More Times and at three minutes and ten seconds just after the guitar solo and before the bow solo they have a bolero in there. It's in the key of E and you can hear that. Go back and listen to that and then the last one Jimmy Page did one with Led Zeppelin on Achilles' Last Stand on the album Presence. And at eight minutes and, 27, eight minutes and 27 seconds, he has the band doing a grand bolero. It's really intricate, it's in 5-4 time, and it's really, really cool. So the bolero goes back to 1965 for Beck and Page, and Jimmy Page used it all the way through his Led Zeppelin career in those two cases. I'm Carl Baldessar. I hope you like this video and please like, subscribe, leave me some comments. I'd love to know what you thought about this. Give me some other rock riffs that you want me to look into from the classic rock era. I'd love to do that for you. Thank you very much.